<clears throat> okay. Welcome to our board meeting on Wednesday, September 25th, 2019. Bienvenido a nuestra junta el miércoles 25 de septiembre 2019. <laughs> okay, for the Pledge of Allegiance, I will ask Danny. Danny, you have to be closely. It's over this way. It's over this way. <laughs> Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, two things I'm going to say. Um, Jennifer Schachter is not with us tonight because she had to be out of town for a birthday party or for something, birthday party for her daughter. That's why she's not here. And we don't know why Georgia Costa is not here. We don't know why. Um, <laughs> so our translator is here, Virginia. Virginia, nuestro traductor está aquí, Virginia. Um, si necesitas que ella le ayude con sus traducciones, se puede pedir los aparatos con ella. <laughs> I don't know what they're called. <laughs> um, if you would like to speak on the agenda, you must complete a speaker card and give it to Eva. There she is. There's Eva. Si quieres hablar en la agenda, hay que pedir una tarjetita y darlo a Eva. <clears throat> so, tonight our superintendent, because she was selected among superintendents all the way across the country to be in an event. I think it's, is it in Washington, D.C.? Chicago. No, Chicago. Oh, it's in Chicago. She was asked to be in an event because of how well she's doing an event in Chicago. But um, she is going to be on speakerphone for her superintendent comments. And since she is not present, she sent the following video that highlights our work and our partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank. Ready? Mm hmm <laughs> oh. oh, excuse me. Oh. Why do you do this every year? Because uh, we like it. We, we love Second Harvest and uh, we love getting back to the community and it's fun. It's really easy and we just love it. Go Martinelli's. Go Martinelli's.
खाली ये एक लालची इंसान का कहानी है वो और कोई नहीं रामपुर ग्राम निवासी मंगाराम वो Okay, so I thought I was going to hear from her, but she just let us listen to that instead. But <laughs> she was she could have been on speakerphone if she wants to, but she's listening. Well, I I will say hello to everyone. So There I you go. Here, I will only speak um when necessary, but I miss you all. Um I will be here um throughout the meeting. And she's going to be with us the whole meeting on speaker. Okay, so if you need any if if you needed her to answer a question, she's with us all night, <laughs> all evening. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask for governing board comments now, and so I'm going to start with you, Jennifer Holm. All right, so we celebrated uh, music in the plaza with combined performances of our PVUSD students in the Santa Cruz Symphony, and it was it really was a beautiful event, and it was a, a, it was quite touching to me. Um, just to see the community you know enjoying the arts on so many different levels and coming together for that i also attended the food what benefit um, and celebration dinner and listening to students talk about how the program provided education and empowerment and fostered greater connection to the land and their communities was also uh, very inspiring and it was a pleasure to attend both events thank you karen so I just want to briefly um, acknowledge and thank you our sponsor staff and elected officials and community members for attending our fundraiser for the Paro Valley Education Foundation at Jalisco's a couple weeks back. It was a success and we were able to raise a little bit over $2,800 in one night. So thank you so much for everyone's support. Hi. Good evening. Thanks for being here. I'll keep it brief. Um, I too attended the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation event. Um, we're hoping to turn out way a lot more people next time so that we can make more money to help our students. Um, I did attend Aptos High's 50th anniversary and it was, thank you Peggy, it was beautifully, um, and Jennifer Holm was there as well. We both gave small speeches. Um, it was a beautiful day. We had um, um, our drum line, our marching band, or maybe not a marching band, our symphonic band, um, dancers from um, a drama production, and um, lots of dignitaries there. Um, so anyway, thank you and congratulations to Aptos High for 50 great years. And I'm hopeful that um, that you know we're shining up the campus and hopeful that we can do even more over the next few years because it does is in need of continued repair. Um, and finally, I attended Pajaro Valley Prevention uh, Board Meeting, and there's a lot of excitement um, around their new building that is um, happening. Um, and a board member and dear friend of PVPSA um, endowed the organization with monies to n and naming rights for the building. And can you tell me what her name is again? Janet Mayu, the Mayu family, yeah. So we thank them greatly for that um, donation. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Glad to see everybody here tonight. Um, just to touch up, touch up on a couple events. Um, the PVEF organization meeting also passed by with uh, Aurelio. I would like to say thank you, Aurelio, for bringing music to uh, the Placita. And um, I also just wanted to mention, for the, f for the last few weeks, I've been working with the city of Watsonville, the Watsonville City Council, um, so former teachers and some local members to have October 9th recognized as Ray DeHart Day. Ray DeHart was a long time teacher, union worker, um, so, president. union president. <laughs> and so on October 8th at the Watsonville City Council meeting, they will pass a resolution honoring October 9th is ready to heart day so I hope people could come and make it but we'll be here on Wednesday so thank you very much so um, I just want to say for the foundation 
event that we had, we had actually students playing flutes, playing um, clarinets, and I mean, we actually had singers, uh, the choir from Aptos, we had musicians from, I think, Aptos, and we had Elsie Stema, a music program that was there too. It was pretty cool, the foundation. Um, I also went to the event at the plaza, and oh my gosh, with Jennifer Holm, it was so inspiring. I mean, it was like so, I mean, it made me realize how much I love Watsonville. <laughs> really, made me realize that. Um, so we had, just to add what she said, we had um, Elsie Stema there, and they played recorders, and they played the marimbas. They also played marimbas. Um, we had Cesar Chavez Band was there. We had Pato Valley Band was there, and then we had Esperanza del Valle Dance Group that's been here, I don't even know how long, 20, 30 years in Watsonville, and they, 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 they danced with the symphony behind them. It was pretty cool. And then they had a finale, finale with um, the symphony, um, Pato Valley High School Band, and LC Stema all together. It was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so, um, I also went, oh, I just want to say that along with that, I not only went to the plaza, but I actually went to a meeting afterwards, <laughs> Migrant Head Start. I called them and t I, I talked to them and told them, you know, I really wanted to go to this event because it was going to be so special. And they said, well, you know, we're going to have a lot of important things happening at 8 o'clock or afterwards. And so I said, okay, I'll be there. And so I went straight from La Plaza to right here, actually. That's where we have our meeting. Straight to here <laughs> for the meeting that lasted until 10. And they talked about a lot of important issues that they have to deal with. Um, they unfortunately have to cut the budget quite a bit because it's, for example, very difficult for them to pay um, our benefits, for them to pay their benefits and the increases in our benefits. It's, it's hard for them. And it, it's hard for them because they really want to raise the wages of, of the daycare home um, those who run daycare homes, and they're not able to do that because the teachers at the daycare centers, they actually get increases because they get them with the teachers, but their daycare home teachers don't get that. So there's always ways for them to figure that out. So we had to figure out how to do that, and there's a lot of other important things. They're, they're looked at every three years, and they go over their whole program, their finances, everything they do. And they had like incredible highlights about how wonderful they're doing in the classrooms and the daycare homes, their curriculum. You know, they had lots of wonderful things to say about them. And it was more things that happened. And I also really quickly went to the, um, I'm on a committee that's, that's together with the city and the Mellow Center, because we're now running the Mellow Center. There used to be another people doing that. So, um, and, and at this meeting, we were able to actually tour the Mellow Center, and it was really super great. I, I said maybe we should do, have people pay to go, you know, have a tour of the Mellow Center, because we went all the way up six flights of stairs, all the way up to the very, very, very top of the Mellow Center to see um, all their, you know, where they put the cameras and whatever. I mean, all this stuff way up there on the top. Um, but we got to see everything, the dressing rooms, you know, the whole Mellow Center. We did a tour of the entire Mellow Center. It was pretty cool <laughs> to do that, um, along with our meeting. So that was pretty cool. Um, so there you go. There is my report. Thank you. <laughs> um, now we're going to do, so are our high school students here? Which ones are our high school students? Because remember, Eva, you were going to tell me who the high school students are? <laughs> huh? Diamond Tech. I'm asking Diamond Tech to come on up here. You can come up right up to the microphone if you want. And put the microphone down for her. There, you can put it down. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right, so um, good evening, President Osmondson, um, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent, Superintendent Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Thank you for giving Demi Tech an opportunity to show us, um, to talk about what we do at school.
My name is Ana Sanchez, and I'm the Student Council President. Nice to meet you, Ana. <laughs> So after a year of construction, we finally were able to move to our new classrooms over the summer. And it was like really exciting for us because we have everyone on campus right now, uh, which, uh, which contributed to our cultural and we're bonding even more with the freshmen, the seniors and juniors are bonding more with the freshmen this year. Um, and as well, um, seniors and juniors are no longer late for lunch because of the transportation issue from campus to campus. So the beginning of school went really well as we had several day one sessions where we had an opportunity to do some team building, character building, cult setting, and we ended the day with traditional with our traditional science assembly where, where, um, where we celebrate the sunrise scene and our seniors last year of high school, the seniors gave the underclassmen some advice about how to survive their high school, their high school um, years, and the underclassmen gave the seniors words of encouragement at the end of the year. Also, at the end of the year, we have a sunset assembly um, to celebrate their success. So this year, we actually created a new s system for the student party leadership, which was that we selected six um, executive members, and each executive member selected an appointed officer. And with that, it helped us. It helped. Um, we have the more We have more participation in student activities. So for this year, and also we have had a lot of fun. So one of the events that we were in charge of was September 16, Independence Day, in where we decorated the NPR and also we had a photo booth included. And some of the acti activities we did was Chayin Jenka, Connect Four, and also we did tie dye. Even though it was a bit messy, but they really had a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so we started our first Sammy Tech volleyball team. Um, so far, we have won two games and lost two games as well. But the things like we practice and the concrete, so it was a great disadvantage for them. But overall, we're really proud of them. So last year, one of our goals was to raise money to create a new student space to increase our guard as our student population is increasing. We finally achieved our goal just in time for us to finish the project before school started this year. Um, so now this year goal is to uh, is to fundraise enough money to buy a van in order to transport our students to special events or to their sports competition. Since our principal, Ms. Keller, she has a track, but it only fits seven people in there. Also, um, one of the one of our biggest fundraiser this year is Apulga or flea market, which is on October eight um, on October twelfth from eight to three, where people from a community buy vendor space for $20 and come out, sell, have a good time, and have a good time, eat, and enjoy good music. Um, well, if you guys or any of you guys are interested to buy a vendor space, um, contact the number that's on the screen, and also come to our flea market, which is actually really fun. October. It's on October 12th from eight to three. So you guys are officially invited if you guys want to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to share what we have been doing at Diamond Tech. And I look forward to visiting again soon. Okay. Are there are there any more high school representatives here? No? Okay, thank you, Diamond Tech. And I hope there's starting, we're gonna have in the next board meeting a lot more high school representatives here with us. <coughs> um, now we're gonna do the approval of the agenda. Not so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Move approval. Um, Trustee Holt. Uh, uh, can we amend uh, to pull 11.18? We have a parent who wishes to address it with limited time. Can we bring 11.18 further? I would like to have a point of order around this because it is on the consent agenda. So normally we, we would right. pull it off the consent agenda, but we'd like to move it up higher on the agenda. Where's Alicia? Right Alicia is not in the room. She's I don't taking know, I the don't picture. Think we should take, I don't know if we should. It's the very last thing on the agenda, and there's, um, there's. So we want to move eleven point eighteen up. Okay. Oh, the very last one. Mm-hmm. And, and it's on the consent, 18. so we need to pull it off the consent and put it above. But I'm not sure yeah. how to do that. No, eleven point eighteen. Right here. It, it's well, it's. It, it is an item. How much do we can pull it? 11.18 architectural services for the SELPA. Can I make a motion to pull 11.18 from the consent agenda first and then process issues? Because usually, you know, we, we do, you know, we defer the items from 11 point, you know, on, the, on that time when we do the consent agenda. So I don't know about So, Kristen, I see that you're nodding your head. Is that something that we're able to do? We're trying to pull an item from the consent agenda and move it up to earlier in the okay. agenda. Yeah, so what you would do is you would pull 11.18, make it a deferred consent item, which is number 12, and then you would move number 12 up in the agenda. That's the, that's the process you'd have to take. So you'd have to defer it, make it number 12, which is our deferred consent item, and then place it um, in the location that you want to place it, number 12. So thank you, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, but do we have to pull the entire consent agenda up then earlier? No, we do not, okay. No, but if you have a point of order would be if you want to defer any other items, you'd have to do it concurrently. So you need to identify if there's any other consent items that you want to defer because you'd have to defer all of them at the same time. Okay. So does, right. are there any other consent agenda items that need to be deferred tonight? No. All right, so then I admit my motion to pull item 11.18 from the consent agenda to a deferred consent item and move item 12 um, up to before 9.1. I'll second. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you what yeah. all the call for the vote. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. So, so first and second, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed. So now it's one, two, three, four, five, zero, two. <clears throat> um, okay, now we're going to do the approval of agenda again. <laughs> no. Oh, we already did that. We did point it. one. <clears throat> so we're going to do the approval of the minutes. So we're going to do the approval. 5.1 of September 11th board meeting minutes. Can I'll make I a motion to approve uh, our board meeting minutes. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 502. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to have a public hearing. Boom, boom, boom. <clears throat> and it's about the um, 6.1 Williams sufficiency of textbooks report by Lisa Aguirre. Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. <laughs> okay. Good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, Ed code requires us to hold a public hearing each year on the sufficiency of instructional materials. During the first through third weeks of school, represent, representatives from the County Office of Education visit 19 schools across the district to, uh, to, 
ensure that students have core textbooks and instructional materials. All principals indicate a positive Williams report and state that sufficient materials are, exist within the classrooms. The Santa Cruz County Office will follow up in November with a full report. Okie dokie. And it includes, you know, everything, lab, science, everything. Includes lab science, instructional materials. And instructional materials. Yeah. And for both elementary, secondary, whatever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Is there any um, board comments? it's on this one I don't think so no <coughs> so is there any board comments there is yeah. hi Lisa hi um, I have a question about the science curriculums that we've adopted um, I was under the impression that there was a movement from the County Office of Education that there was curriculum specially chosen that nine of our surrounding school districts adopted but Pajaro Valley went its own way and I'm wondering if you could talk about that and why that why did we not adopt the curriculum that the other nine school districts adopted countywide I'm not 100% sure why we didn't choose the same um, materials I can let you know that currently our middle school um, are going through an adoption process so they're piloting two different um, core um, materials to, and then the adoption will take place in the spring. The high school, we have a, um, a, piloting, a pilot happening for biology in the spring with adoption set to happen. And then we're going to chemistry the following year and then physics the following year. For as far as with the elementary, that is pushed out with the um, EL, current ELA adoption and then math just happened that we're giving elementary um, Right now, we're giving the, allowing them to have um, the space to do the ELA adoption, which will um, finish up next year before we go into the science adoption. So they did math, ELA, and then they're going to do science. As far as the what the other districts um, adopted, I am not 100% sure. OK. And this might not be the right venue for that question, so maybe I'll take that offline at another time. We, but we I are, would like to know, I think the board deserves to know more about what happened with, with that particular issue because that curriculum that was chosen by very, a lot of very you know, smart, well-meaning people. Mm -hmm. and Do you know what grade levels it was for? I don't know, but I'd like to know more about it. Okay. It was brought to my attention okay. recently. I'll reach out to uh, my colleagues in the other in the county and the other um, school districts to find out. Any other comments? I, yeah, I have a comment. So under language arts, so we've adopted the ELA curriculum or not? For elementary. Just for elementary. Yes, for, the, for this year we're doing benchmark advance. It's the first, we have nine schools going through the, um, we adopted and nine, nine schools doing the implementation this year, the other seven next year. A middle school had an ELA adoption two years ago. And then I'm guessing that, that um, the Houghton Mifflin that I'm looking at here, that's from 2002, are we still using that? Is it under the elementary? Yeah. So the seven schools that are not in the first wave of adoption, they still have those materials for this year. Okay. So next year they will have the, the benchmark. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you. Just a quick, yeah, the, and the textbooks are in good shape. I haven't heard any complaints about anything, but we're. We, re we replace textbooks yearly, so okay. when we find out that um, textbooks, they're not able to be used by students, we do replace them. Um, we find this information out from the school sites. So as we find out the information, we do replace. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so knock, 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 the public hearing is over. I guess I say it with my speaker. Um, now we're going to do visitor non-agenda items. Yes. We have one so far, and it's Laura Zucker. Zucker. Okay. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Laura Zucker. I'm a speech pathologist uh, for special education at Hyde School. Um, I hear people sometimes say, I hear people sometimes have ideas that they'd like to share with their administrators in SALPA or something that they think should be changed, like, you know, we need a better ratio of, um, of adults to children in the classroom. But when I say, why don't you say something? Or even, why don't you go to the board and say something? I will often hear people say, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to make trouble. I want to keep my head down. I'm afraid of retaliation. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I know. But listen, retaliation is very hard to prove. But the very fact the word is out there is getting really scary for me, frankly. I'd like to have people say what they want to say and not be afraid of this. The problem with people, people being scared to say something is that things can go really wrong. Think of a hypothetical. We have an ed code, and the ed code, for instance, says that we have to test um, children at different times of the year, for triennials, every three years, of course, when you transition from preschool to kindergarten. You have to formally assess a child, or at least do a review of records with parent permission. What if it happened that that didn't happen, and those of us in kindergarten who work with kindergarten kids started seeing IEPs come in, this is hypothetical again, where the kids had not been assessed? If the only thing we would think is that the teachers must have all been afraid to say, hey, boss, I think this is a violation of ed code. And the problem is it, they would be even scarier in this situation because the teachers would be putting their own credentials and their own licenses at risk by not, by being complicit in violating ed code. But frankly, who would say it? It's a meeting. It, it, it's in black and white. Who's going to say to your boss, oh my gosh, I think you're misinterpreting this part of the education code. This has to be done. It's right here in 56.44.5. That's it. And um, if teachers are that afraid to say, I think this might be wrong, this is not safe, this could hypothetically happen. And that would be so damaging, and I'm out of time. But I think we need to create community. We need, we need, we need to have people stop saying to their SELPA representatives, I mean their um, SELPA union reps, I'm afraid, to, I'm afraid to raise my hand, I'm afraid to be a whistleblower, I'm gonna keep my head down and my mouth shut. We need people to stop saying that because we could get in a lot of trouble. It's not good for the kids, it's not good for the families, it's certainly not good for retraction and, I mean attraction, uh, attraction and retention of teachers because it's very sad and very demoralizing when we do think that people aren't able to say what they think would be best for the children. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not responding totally to her. But I'm just saying I, I received about, I don't know how many, 15 or 20 questions from somebody in SELPA. And so I was able to transfer those questions to Heather and to Dr. Rodriguez to ask her to answer all of them. So I did receive a lot of questions that I'm going to have answered. I just wanted to say that to you. Thank you. <laughs> Employee organizations now. Mm -hmm. The Pottle Valley Federation of Teachers. Nelly. <laughs> nice Hi, good to evening. see you. Good evening. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, well, you just heard one of our members speak, and um, I'll reference that in a bit. But what I want to start off with is a thank you to Human Resources for um, doing the right thing in our district. And thank you to Dr. Rodriguez for being a part of that um, correction. And I spoke, the last time I spoke to you, I spoke in regards to our temporary status teachers in the early childhood education program. <coughs> Excuse me. And they, today, um, Dr. Kailin went out and personally met with a small group of teachers at a site mm -hmm. and delivered the letter rescinding the one that had been delivered in the week of August 26th. So that gave them um, a sense of, of well, ease, the, uh, ease their stress. Um, and it was also really good that Dr. Kyleen was able to go out and do that personally. I think that that meant a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that the teachers truly appreciated that. Mm -hmm. They're very thankful. Um, and that was a result of stepping back and reflecting 
on the concerns that were addressed as opposed to, oh, there's another complaining person, there's another complaining unit. But HR was able to step back and reflect on those concerns and realize that there was an issue with that letter that had been delivered several weeks ago and were able to make those corrections. <clears throat> so, you know, acknowledging and respecting the professional ability of, of educators, people that are in the classroom that are implementing the, the programs, that's important. And we do have committees in place where our educators can be heard, but are they really being heard is the question. So, you know, we as educators, we are all about our mission statement for our district. We are about having our students reach that higher potential, having our students become global citizens. Case in point, having teachers who spent time teaching science um, to the climate science to our high school students and other teachers who part, part, most likely partook in having students per, walk to the plaza and be part of that climate strike. That there is our educators modeling what it is to be a global citizen, a, a future leader. So we have committees in place. It is time for our educators that show up to these committees and give their input to actually be heard. So that if they say, you know, this curriculum really doesn't work, and here's why, then let's pause, let's save, and let's go back and look at something else. Let's no, let the teachers know, we hear you, because they're the ones implementing. Um, and if we are looking for success, the success is also honoring and respecting the intelligence of our teachers. So emotional intelligence also on everybody's part. But that's all I wanted to say for tonight, but thank you, um, and thank you, Jonah. CSEA, California School Employees Association. Good to see you here. Nice Thank to you. see you too. <laughs> Good evening, <laughs> President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, Cabinet, Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Esther Murillo, and I'm Chief Job Stewart for CSEA Chapter 132. I'd like to report that we have had several meetings in regards to the implementation of ESCAPE and Synergy. Thank you very much, technology, for coming through and having a round table and listening to our concerns and our wants for helping us get through this tough time of implementing two programs at one time. Mm -hmm. We also had a meeting today with Lisa Geary that had pertained to our registrars and our student um, information system specialist. So um, we're gonna meet again. And again, technology was present, and they're gonna also assist us in getting additional training. I hope to get a date soon on uh, with the attendance specialist and implementing some additional training and also being able to view their concerns that they have. Uh, the program is great. It's just the knowledge that comes with it and actually implementing the program and how to get around the system. Um, as far as negotiations, we just begun. We've had two sessions, and we look forward to next month. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you. <clears throat> so do we have a manager here from the Pottle Valley, I guess Association of Managers. Is there a manager here that wants to talk? Mm, no. Okay, Communication Workers of America. Never seen them here before. <laughs> um, we're gonna have, before we have action items, we're gonna actually have report and discussion items. And is, is Mas Hashimoto here? Oh, there you are, so good to see you. Point of order. So, so be, uh, I'm sorry, so before we move on to that item, we did um, ask for 11.18 oh. to be oh, moved prior yeah. to that report. We did, we did, just a second. We'll have you in just a second. <laughs> so 11.18, which is from our consent agenda, which says, let's 
see where it says. Okay, the 11.18 is architectural services for the SELPA alterations at Aptos High School. So yes, uh, the, I know the item was um, pulled uh, and put on the agenda, so I'm, I'm available for questions. So this item specifically is for uh, Maddie Architects uh, at Aptos High School, and it's pertaining to uh, building I and I believe a portion of E and uh, the life skills classroom for our SELPA program. Uh, this was a, a project that uh, for one reason or another was on hold, and so we were proactive once it came to our attention, and uh, this is the first step. The architect uh, has did preliminary, um, uh, preliminary meeting to get uh, gather input and is in the process once board approved. Um, we will work on finalizing the schematic and program design uh, of the uh, services for SELPA. And then in approximately two to three weeks, we're gonna finalize cost estimating, uh, how much it'll cost uh, the district to implement. And then within the month uh, after that, we will uh, put together a timeline to advertise for uh, bidding uh, and board approval, and that'll come back to the board uh, to award a contract to a contractor uh, to, the to complete the necessary work. And also in that process, we also do a, a job walk at the site uh, with potential contractors. Um, so that's kind of a summary um, of the process, and we're excited to have this uh, on the agenda this evening to move it forward. Okay. Thank you so much, Joe. You're welcome. So, no comments. Is there any comments from the board? Just that I, you know, I appreciate the the work that's that's happening to make sure our, our particularly the most vulnerable students are in an environment that supports their learning. You're welcome. We d we don't know why it was on hold exactly, right? Yeah, we're still looking um, back at that and still trying to confirm, and we're unable to to confirm exactly why. Uh, but when it was brought, um, we have our SELPA uh, staff leadership and school site leadership and concerned parents. And uh, once it was brought to our attention, we worked uh, hand in hand with parents and our uh, site leadership and our SELPA program. And uh, it's here this evening, so. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? So since this is a classroom remodel um, for kids with um, various challenges and disabilities, are, is this architectural firm going to be, like, do they know how to build a classroom out that will meet the needs of our students that are very diverse in that classroom? Yes, so they're very very knowledgeable. Um, our uh, director of purchasing, uh, Richard Ariano, and myself and our facility staff uh, did a um, pre-qualification and an RFP for architectural firms that specialize in K-12 uh, facilities. And so this firm is knowledgeable in uh, special ed or SELPA services and classroom configuration and also restroom modifications. Um, so the purpose of bringing Maddie on to assist us in this is we wanted to make sure that it's done correctly um, and that we follow all the, all the by ed code but also construction code. So we're making sure that we uh, follow the very thorough process. And will this project have to go through DSA that is, there may be a portions uh, of this scope that might have to go to DSA okay. and some that may not. And so that is something that we'll also figure out within the next month uh, as we finalize the scope um, in the sequence of the project. And is this a project that can be put in the queue for Proposition 51? Uh, no, but it can be uh, where we're looking at is using, and I thank the board support last board meeting, so this actually qualifies for our developer fees. So this would be a project that would be funded by developer fees. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Chief Business Officer Joe, for pushing these Measure L projects as fast as you could. Um, it's been a while, but thank you for making it happen. You're welcome. Any more comments? I'm ready to make a motion to approve this item. It is. It's a consent agenda, so it is an action item. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 502. <coughs> I forgot now. Mm -hmm. 
so now we're going to be able to get Mosh, Mas Hashimoto to pr do a presentation on Japanese American Citizens League. Mas Hashimoto. Ah. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about our Watsonville Nikkei community. Now, Nikkei means of Japanese ancestry. Watsonville is as famous as San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, San Jose. Why? <laughs> because many families got their start here in Watsonville and the Pajaro Valley, and they are truly grateful. Kawakami, thank you. And our middle school students, teachers, administrators, and parents for their support of our Kawakami Sister City ex Student Exchange Program. The Kawakami students enjoyed their visit here last month. Of the 100 sister cities in Northern California, our program is considered to be the very best by the Consulate of, uh, Consul General of Japan, San Francisco office. We thank Ann Soldo for starting the program back in 1986, and to Rob Maeda, a retired PVUSD teacher and administrator, his wife Dorothy, and Phyllis Nagamine, who presently is a PF, uh, Paro Valley Unified School District classified employee for their volunteer work these many years. Our middle school students will visit Kawakami in May of 2020. The Japanese have learned to love tacos, burritos, enchiladas, for our students have to prepare a meal for their host families. Back in 1936, a young Japanese college student attended the University of Southern California. During the summer vacation, he stayed in Watsonville at the Hayashi boarding house on First Street. My father liked him so much that he became a member of our family. He ate with us. He learned of the hardships of the Ise immigrants and of their successes. When he returned to Japan in 1937, he ran for the Diet, that's their Congress, and won against General Tojo's political party. And he did so with the help of Kan Abe, the grandfather of the present Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. Since he was pro-America, he was placed under house arrest during World War II. After the war, he was wanted, he was needed. He returned to the government and held 10 positions, cabinet positions, before becoming Prime Minister of Japan in 1972. What Prime Minister of Japan once lived in Watsonville? <laughs> mm. It was Takeo Miki. And his campaign was one on cleaning up the government. There was bribery in his political party and in the government. And Lockheed Corporation had a lot to do with the bribery. I often wonder which Kawakami student will one day become Prime Minister of Japan. The most famous Watsonville High School student in Japan is John Sippen. His father was Filipino and his mother white. Their marriage was against the law. John batted behind Sadahara O oh of the Tokyo Giants, Japan's all-time leading home run hitter. John is one of the nine best baseball players ever in Japan. He was inducted into their Hall of Fame and Watsonville High School Foundation's Hall of Fame. Wow. Kokoro Nagako. We are grateful for the support of PVUSD 
uh, teachers and administrators, Kokoro no Gakko means a school with a heart. In 1989, Mark Takeuchi, a PVUSD music teacher, and Dr. Gerald Kondo started this Japanese cultural summer school for children from kindergarten to sixth grade. The school is open to all. Most of the teachers are certified PVUSD teachers. Some are retired. Wakamatsu Silk and Tea Colony near Placerville, California. Hmm. Of a historical note, the first Japanese colony came in 1869, only a year after the establishment of Watsonville, Martinelli's, and the Register Pajaronian. The colony tragically failed for the lack of support from Japan. 1892, Kazuko Kimura came to Watsonville. He spoke some English. He was the leader of the Japanese Association who helped find jobs and meet the needs of the Issei Japanese immigrants. We believe he came from Nagasaki and was a Catholic. He died in 1900 and is buried in the Catholic Pioneer Cemetery on Freedom Boulevard. Japanese laborers follow the crop. At first, at first, they were cheated out of their wages by the growers. Next time, they didn't work so hard. Emperor Meiji heard that Japanese workers didn't have a very good reputation, and he ordered them, all of them, to fulfill each and every contract regardless. The reputation of Japanese for hard work, honesty, and integrity increased. The migrants were educated as Japan had adopted compulsory education for all. Some who came were college graduates. They can read and write in one language, they can read and write in another language. Cherry trees. In gratefulness, the Japanese Association donated hundreds of flower cherry trees following Japan's donation of cherry trees to Washington, D.C. They donated to the city of Watsonville and city schools. During World War II, nearly all of the trees were vandalized and removed. A few remaining trees remained at Minty White and at Watsonville High School but they recently died or were, were removed. Supervisor Greg Caput donated several trees to Mindy White and Watsonville High School. A tree donated by the Watsonville Santa Cruz JACL to Watsonville High School in gratitude for the years of service to Japanese American students has been vandalized twice and probably will not survive this winter. Its name is Neko, which means cat, for wildcat. The Japanese government, in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Washington cherry trees, donated a flowering cherry tree to the city of Watsonville, and it is growing and doing well in the city plaza. The Japanese Presbyterian Church was established in 1898 and was located on Union Street, where the Salvation Army is located today. The church moved in 1929 to its present site on the west side of town and is known as Westview Presbyterian Church. The Buddhist temple was established in 1906 and was located on the corner of Union and now Riverside Drive where El Pueblo Supermarket is situated today. The temple was forced to move to Bridge Street, and the temple just held a very successful chicken tadiyaki dinner. Visitors from the Central Valley are astonished that there's no fences around the temple. Japantowns. Watsonville's Japantown centered 
around Lower Main, Lower, uh, Main Street and Lower Union Street. In the past, in California, there were 43 Japan towns in California, but now there are only three left, San Francisco, San Jose, and Los Angeles. Japan town is gone, but our work continues with the Wattsville Santa Cruz JACL chapter of the National Japanese American Citizen League. Marsha Hashimoto, a retired PVUSD kindergarten teacher, is president. And I might add, we have some members of our organization here. Victor Kimura, yeah. Gary and Cindy Mine. Oh, and Dan Dodge, Jr. Of 100 JACL chapters in the country, we are the fourth largest. Only Chicago, Seattle, and Portugal, uh, Portland, Portugal, Portland are larger. Our members also include Americans of Croatian, Chinese, African, Hispanic, Irish, Portuguese, and other ethnic societies. We welcome all who support human and civil rights social justice, education, and cultural outreach. Our JCL chapter strongly opposed a secession attempt in the PVUSD back in 1996. Watson High School, class of 1992. We are grateful to this centennial class who invited the Nisei graduates of 1942 to return to receive their cap and gown ceremony and diplomas. There were 47 Nisei seniors, almost one third of the graduating class. However, only 13 students, now 68 years of age, and grandparents returned to celebrate. Watsonville High School was the very first in the nation to do this. UC Berkeley not wishing to wait a whole year, hurriedly organized theirs in September. Other high schools, community colleges, and universities followed suit. You see, we were forced to move in April. Graduation takes place in June. Our kids didn't get to graduate with their classmates. Liberty loss, lessons in loyalty. 17 years ago, with the support of the Paro Valley Unified School District, Watsonville High School, the School of the Arts, Cabrillo College, UCSC, City of Watsonville, the Police Department, Fire Department, Caltrans, Muni Bus System, local businesses, and hundreds of participants. We were the first and only one to reenact the forced evic eviction from our homes during World War II. We wanted to thank those who supported us during our ordeal, who remained faithful, loyal to us as we were loyal to the United States. Many who supported us were public school teachers. I might add, my prison number is 12524D. During World War II, I was a prisoner of war, but I was held by my own country. There were 203 Japanese Americans who served honorably in the United States Armed Forces during World War II from Watsonville and the Pajaro Valley. They served with the 142nd Regimental Combat Team, the most honored and decorated unit of the United States Army during World War II for its size and length of service. And there was a military intelligence service, MIS, which is credited with shortening the war by two years, according to General Douglas MacArthur's intelligence staff. We used the Japanese language as a secret weapon against the Japanese. The MIS today is located at the Presidio of Monterey and is known as the Defense 
Language Institute. My two older brothers, graduates of Watsonville High School, class of 1938 and 1940, served with the Military Intelligence Service. Another served in the United States Navy during the Korean War. I served during the Cold War. I might point out that six of our soldiers who served during World War II were killed in action. Two received the Distinguished Service Cross. There's only one medal higher, and that's the Medal of Honor. Congress apologized for the unjust incarceration of 120,000 innocent persons of Japanese ancestry with the Civil Liberties Act of August 10, 1988. Congress awarded the Congressional, Medal of, Congressional Gold Medal to the men of the 142nd MIS in the year 2010. This is a replica of that gold medal. The original is in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. With the support of Cabrillo College, we held a forum in 2016 entitled Toward a More Perfect Union Overcoming Islamophobia. The work continues. Last year, the United States, United States Supreme Court overturned the Fred Korematsu case of military necessity, but the victory was short-lived. For in the same breath, it approved the administration's Muslim travel ban. Our Nikkei nation will disappear within two generations, without immigration from Japan, and with interracial marriages, the Nikkei nation will disappear, except perhaps in surnames. However, we hope Americans will continue to enjoy Japanese culture and philosophy. There's more to Japanese culture than teriyaki bonsai Ninja warrior, Godzilla. <laughs> thank you. And thank the Pajaro Valley Unified School District for its tremendous support of our Japanese American community. We are eternally grateful. Thank you, one and all. So my daughter went to the Buddhist church and was there. I think she was just in kindergarten, and his wife was my daughter's teacher, his wife. <laughs> you remember that, right? <laughs> oh, do you want me? No comments, yeah. OK. Any, no comments or questions? OK. Um, now we're going to do a very important report. It's 10.2 on PVPSA report on tobacco, vaping, and associated health impacts by Erica Padilla Chavez, PVPSA Chief Executive Officer and Empower Watsonville Team. That's right. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh. President Osmondson, members of the board. As stated, my name is Erika Padilla Chavez, a proud uh, uh, Wildcat alumni, and I can't start this presentation without first acknowledging um, Mr. Hashimoto's influence in getting this girl who had no idea was college bound to get into Cal. And I don't know that you know this, Mr. Hashimoto, but you were really the first teacher at Watsonville High that saw me for me. I had no idea there was a University of California system, 
right, as the daughter of, of uh, immigrants who thought college meant Cabrillo. Not that there's anything wrong with Cabrillo. I'm a big supporter of a community college. But Mr. Hashimoto played a huge influence. So hearing his, his passion for um, and, and heritage and passion for sharing the history with us, I want to share that part of history of me with you tonight. I'm here tonight specifically to introduce um, members of our team and members of the Empower Watsonville group who have been working very arduously to, um, to advocate for changes in some of our local um, regulations regarding the accessibility of some substances that we've all been reading about, uh, nicotine, flavored nicotine specifically. But today, um, two of my stellar um, rock stars at PVPSA, Eric Trejo, uh, who represents the educational arm of our tobacco work. <laughs> and uh, Patricia Mata, who represents the policy side of our tobacco work. <laughs> they will be coming up and presenting some material that I can tell you every time I hear it, I learn something new and it baffles me that this is happening. I'm sure you're in for some education uh, tonight and I know our youth are also gonna be participating in this presentation. Take it away, guys. Hello. Erica Trejo. Good evening, my name is Patricia Mata. I am a policy analyst for PVPSA. And here with me is Erika Trejo. We do have a presentation. Um, we're gonna go through the slides very briefly because we do want to have the youth have an opportunity to speak about their experiences and why this is an important issue for them. Um, so very quickly, we're gonna touch upon uh, basic background, what are E6s, what do they contain, how do they work, what are some of the social health impacts. Um, what we are seeing in the news, our media outlets, what are they telling us? And lastly, um, brief about what also the importance of tobacco-free pharmacies and um, basic uh, practices, best, pra best practices to adopt to protect our youth. Great. Do we, this one? Well, uh, this one? This way? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll start. Um, as Patty mentioned, I'm a uh, prevention educator. Um, so what are e-cigarettes? So an e-cigarette is a uh, mechanical device that delivers a liquid nicotine uh, in an aerosol form. We have this misconception that vaping, or the term that's usually uh, used when people are using these e-cigarette devices, that's what it is, water vapor, but in reality it's aerosol that they're um, putting into their lungs, all right? Um, so what does a device look like and how does it work? So there's always a heating element, we call it a, we call it a coil. Um, it has an on and off button, it comes with a battery, that's the battery that allows it to give it power, a mouthpiece. One of the things that we will be sh uh, seeing a lot more of is these um, devices that don't have an on and off button. Now they are powered with suction, so students don't really have to like turn something on, let it warm up, it's something easy that they can use in classrooms. So e-juice, e-liquids, they come with a variety of chemicals in them. The one that I want to point you guys to is nicotine. Nicotine we find in traditional tobacco combustible cigarettes, right? It's been something that we know has cha changes the development of the uh, adolescent brain, adolescent body as well. And so it's really important for us to make sure that we limit the access that youth have to nicotine in the high dosages that they are receiving it in e-liquid or e-juice. So some of the flavors, so e-juice e companies, vaping companies don't have to reinvent the wheel. They are following in the same steps as traditional tobacco and they know that flavors work. They know that flavors attract children and it goes into the idea that they're no longer creating these products for former smokers, that they're looking at potential customers in fourth, fifth and eighth grade students and obviously high school. So health impacts, so we know that um, students have been complaining of coughing, uh, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, fever, just to name a couple of the symptoms. And just briefly on some of the data, some of the things that we're being, we've been seeing in, in the media news outlets, 
Um, some of this information is from the CDC page, which is one of the most uh, current information about what is happening with uh, individuals who are suffering from either lung disease or um, lung disease asso associated with e-cigarette use or t related products. Um, so if you see on the PowerPoint, um, and just let me, well, let me just focus specifically on CDC. So there's over 530 cases that are reported of individuals uh, that are suffering from lung disease associated with e-cigarette use and um, uh, other related products. There are seven deaths that are reported. That number might be a little bit higher, but there are seven deaths uh, reported that are associated with e-cigarette use. Those, two of those deaths have been in California. Um, when we talk about what are the symptoms or who, who's using what, the individuals who have passed away as a result of e-cigarette use, state of using or having a history of um, using the e-cigarettes with THC, THC and nicotine or nic nicotine alone. Um, so when we're talking about e-cigarette use and e-cigarette use in youth, um, the National Tobacco Youth Survey states that in last year, in 2018, 3.6 million students use e-cigarettes e and vaping devices. 4.9 of those students were middle school students and 20.9 of those students were high school students. That's one out of 20 middle school students who tried e-cigarettes or vapes in the past 30 days in 2018. So that's a huge number. When we're looking specifically here in the uh, California Healthy Kids Survey and PVUSD, and I'm gonna read those numbers just because I wanna make sure that I do have that information and it's accurate for you to understand uh, the impact. So we're looking at specific here in PVUSD, 24% of the 11th grade students reported use or experimentation with e-cigarette devices or vaping devices in 2018. 11% of the 11th graders um, stated using e-cigarettes or other, other devices on a regular basis. When we're talking about youth access, uh, we had a meeting with the chief of police a few weeks ago. Um, a few of the students in our group stated, access is a major factor. So when we're looking at back at the California um, Healthy Kids Service sur survey, they stated that 42% of 11th graders reported finding it very easy to access e-cigarettes or a vaping device. So going back to the meeting with the chief of police, um, we asked the students, if you wanted to obtain an e-cigarette, how fast would you be able to obtain an e-cigarette or a vape? And they, said, they stated by the end of the day, I would be able to access one. So it's very accessible. Um, just very, really briefly, going back to the CDC data, out of those 530 cases that are reported, 16% um, of those cases are under the age of 18 out of the 530 reported cases that are suffering from lung disease as a result of e cigarette use or uh, vaping devices. When we're talking about tobacco and pharmacies, why is this an important issue? The answer is very simple. When we have tobacco products in pharmacies, it's sending a mi mixed message that tobacco is not as harmful as other substances. Um, so when we're talking about individuals who are trying to quit smoking, if they go into the pharmacy and they go to the back of the pharmacy to obtain their quit aids, and then they have to go back to the beginning of the, uh, the front of the store to check out, what they're gonna see is going, um, right behind the cash registers, the tobacco products that are easy, easily for them to purchase. So that's one of the main reasons. It's really sending a perception that tobacco is not harmful. In Watsonville, there's two, um, there's total of eight pharmacies. Two of those pharmacies are currently selling tobacco products. So when we're looking specifically at community members who support this issue, we surveyed over 175 individuals who stated that they felt that tobacco products should not be sold in pharmacies, and 91% of those respondents stated that they would be willing to support the pharmacy if they uh, discontinue to sell tobacco products in pharmacies. So we just want to have the opportunity to have our youth share about their experiences, why this is an important issue for them, and what they're seeing in their community or in, um, in the schools. So we have Sebastian, Miguel, Saul, Marilyn, Itzel and Carla, who will be sharing a few words with us. Um, for me, I had a, like a personal experience uh, with kids smoking uh, tobacco within the, within the bathrooms. 
because during one of my periods, I just a- asked to go to the bathroom. And I, I wasn't really able to go to the bathroom that's closest because there was kids that were smoking tobacco products in those bathrooms. So I then had to go to another bathroom at the risk of also being late to the class. Um, good evening, my name is Miguel, and I'm here with PUPSA. And my major concern for the tobacco products, as you can see, are is uh, that amount of accessibility. I know we've had a meeting with Mr. Daniel over here uh, about the accessibility, and he's just told us so many stories. And um, what I say is that we take a step in it now while we still can, then rather to wait for it till it gets till the numbers get a lot more bigger. So. Yeah, that's basically, you know, we've come here to ask for your support with this and this movement. Uh, this is one of the first steps to something bigger. So thank you for your time. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Saul. Um, and a lot of the things that I've noticed with, like, you know, e-cigarettes and stuff like that is that um, I do see it a lot in schools, you know, in the bathrooms, like he said. Um, also, you know, sometimes just around campus where there's like not really that much supervision. Um, and I do see it as an issue because it's not, you know, there's, there's also that the addiction that can, you know, target like that can impact, you know, students and people and kids, you know, in my grade, too. Like they, they're using these products, and I'm not like I'm not really sure if they're, you know, becoming addicted to any of these substances. Um, and yeah, I've just been seeing, yeah, just a lot of that, the use, you know, that it's, it's increasing with like, even with people that I know. Um, and that, that's all. Okay, um, first of all, thank you for your time. Um, I'm Marilyn, and um, my sister, my little sister, she's in sixth grade, and she comes home telling us that kids in her, the back of the bus are, vape, are vaping, and I'm like, how do they even get their hands on that kind of stuff? They're so young. When I was in sixth grade, like, that was never, like, talked about or mentioned, and, like, they'll, they'll even tell me that they're smoking in the back of the class, and the teacher's not even, like, doing anything about it, or, like, they just won't notice. Um, um, here are some examples of what they look like. We, 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 we brought these um, to the farmer's market so we can kind of educate the parents on what they kind of look like because they look like objects you would like normally have. Like some look like USBs, some look like pens you just write with. So we like to, we would like to educate people more about what they look like. That looks like a little iPod and they just look like regular object, objects. So I think that um, the other one, oh yeah, we're passing them, they're coming around. But yeah, I think it's a really big issue and I really don't want my sister to be around that because I care a lot for her and you know, they can get very um, dangerous. So thank you. Um, hi, my name is Ilse. Um, I've also had personal experiences um, with vaping in classrooms. Um, just recently, actually, um, I heard these two guys, like, they're like, oh, pass the pen. And the teacher, like, they kind of they kind of saw that um, they were passing the pen, but they really thought it was just a pen because it looks just like a pen. And just as Marilyn, I also have a little brother in middle school, a sixth grader. And this is most concerning for me because I wouldn't want my little brother doing that. And I wouldn't like my little brother to like own a pro- this product. So I kind of just also want to put more like awareness for the teachers because they, they're not aware of like how these things look, like if they really look like any other regular objects. So yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Carla, and 
Uh, I would want for the tobacco, the flavored tobacco to be um, banned because I have this friend that um, goes to drugs or like vaping when she has problems. And I told her like, oh, like you should stop. And she said she would, but sh every time she would just do it. And I think she's addicted or something, but she's like saying she's not. And I wouldn't want her to do like more hardcore drugs and die. Thank you. So when we're talking about best practices, currently what we're doing at PPPS is that we're trying to provide education and bring awareness not only to the students but also to the community. Through our Duper program, our uh, Tupe staff, prevention tobacco specialists, go out to the schools at various school sites from 4th through 12th grade, and they provide education on tobacco, vaping, other substances, and also um, life, life skills and decision making. So why is that important? Is because when a student is presenting and so presented with a situation where they have to decide whether they're going to fall into their peer pressure or say no, that's why it's important for that education. In addition to that, we also have other local jurisdictions who've already passed uh, local laws prohibiting the sale of tobacco products in their cities. The city of Santa Cruz, the city of Capitola, and the county of Santa Cruz, which are the closest to us, have already uh, adopted a ban that will, ban uh, that will take effect on January 1st of 2020, banning all flavored tobacco products, including menthol, in their jurisdictions. Additionally, there's over 32 counties or communities that have already adopted similar, similar um, local policies. In Watsonville, we're trying to do the same thing here. We're trying to f uh, follow the same direction. Um, at the state level, there's um, SB 39, which is a legislation passed by Gover Governor Newsom, who stated that, um, that what this, legis this legislation will do is that it will establish restrictions that will make it harder for individuals to, for anybody to buy tobacco products online or VML. So that will be restricted because we're talking about access, that's very important. Um, additionally, the Trump administration has also um, uh, directed the FDA to develop a policy that will also do the similar thing at a federal level, ban any tobacco, deliver tobacco products that are not uh, any other than tobacco. Um, so there is already progress, we're all moving towards uh, direction that will allow us to not only have the education piece, but also establish laws and policies that will help us protect our youth. But we still need to move forward, and it all starts at a local level, um, which is the reason why we're here this evening um, asking and seeking for your support. Um, I want to thank the board members that we were able to meet with or um, had a conversation about our efforts. Um, I also want to thank um, Board of Trustee Maria Orozco, that, who has helped us in this process and who has also helped us draft this resolution that, we, uh, that will be presented later this evening. Thank you. Yeah. And questions? Um, and, and just to clarify, it's going to be a ban on flavored tobacco products, which include um, vaping products that fall under the, that umbrella, even though they're not the traditional, um, you know, you light something on fire and you inhale the smoke. So the ban on flavored tobacco products. Um, and we're going to be having a conference October 19th where our youth here are going to be presenting and educating their peers about the dangers of nicotine exposure at a very young age and traditional tobacco as well. So I invite everybody to attend. It's going to be at the Metal Center. Any questions? Um, I was astounded when you passed this around, those little things that they use. Like, whoa, you're kidding me. That's got to be, I mean, <laughs> number one, don't they have to cost something to be able to buy one of those things? I mean, where, how do they buy them? I mean, because they look pretty fancy, little fan very fancy little looking things. I'm like really astounded. Well, and, and well, I have so many questions about this. <laughs> I mean, how do they know which flavor that they're getting with those little fancy objects? I mean, how do they pick the flavors? I mean, I'm just, whoa, I, I'm just astounded. You know, I didn't, I guess I didn't know practically anything. I mean, I've heard all about it, but like, whoa, listening to you today and seeing them, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> um, so, I mean, yeah, so I'd like to know all about, you know, how people, the cost of them and why it's so easy for them to get them. You know, how can they go and just get them so easily? You know, young people, um, how they, you know, they get, how, you know, the, they pay for the cost of them or whatever. I mean, 
And I mean, how do really young people get a hold of those things? And how do they pick? Them? I mean, I, I just don't know so much. I don't know about. Um, you know what I'm saying? And and I, I read the resolution, and it talked about restrictions. It didn't talk about ban. I, I think I read the resolution that said restricting. It didn't say ban. And I'm totally supportive of a ban, not a restriction. <laughs> a ban, not a restriction. Yeah, because I think it said restriction. I'm pretty sure it said that. Not a ban. Okay. So, so I'll answer the first part. It, um, yeah, so I need. So just from talking to our youth, one of the things that we've heard is that the easiest way to get vape pens or e-cigarettes or even e-juice um, would be uh, online. It's extremely easy. Really, there's no verification that somebody is over the age of 18, because remember, we're one of the few states that requires somebody to be over the age of 21. Um, but they can get online pretty easily. And they, they also know um, adults who are selling this um, you know, on the, in the black market who are you know, going out and offering them to kids. Um, because of the amount of nicotine, because of the amount of puffs that somebody can get from an e-cigarette product, um, there is not costing as much because you know it's not like a limited amount of like one pack of cigarettes, twenty dollars. Um, so it's very accessible to children. Mm -hmm. I totally understand what you're saying online, you know, because whatever, there's no restrictions online. You can just do whatever. Um, so that's basically they're just ordering them online, young people. I mean, and young, young people can order them online. It doesn't matter. I mean, you could. Well, I mean, and if they can't get it for themselves, somebody will get that for them. Yeah, somebody can just order them mm -hmm. for them, too. Yeah. Of course. Absolutely. Oh, God. And let me just say something because uh, the policy is so important to us. The, the Department of Justice recently gave the Watsonville Police Department some funding so that they can begin to do some um, essentially monitoring of our current retailers. And there was a data that Patty put up there that demonstrated how many of our retailers actually got caught selling to minors. And we have a high number of them. So that speaks to one, education, the importance of enforcement. But the step you're gonna be considering tonight is really the elimination of, and what we'll be asking the city council is the elimination of flavored nicotine in Watsonville, right? The flavors. Because we know that that is the vehicle by which kids are getting hooked, right? If you can drink, or, if you can vape horchata, right, juice, or vape some chocolate, it, chocolate, you know, it tastes good, right? And then it hooks you. So we know that that is definitely uh, the hook. But I do want to let you know that we are working in partnership with the County Health Department, the Watsonville Police Department. There's so many agencies that are involved in this effort and we couldn't do it without them. So having your symbolic support tonight could help us um, communicate that to the city council um, because ultimately you are the body that's responsible for all of our, many of our young people that um, come to school here at PVUSD. I just wanna ask you, so could somebody else or anybody, I mean, so there's, well, you probably would know what pharmacies, for example, in Watsonville are actually providing those vaping, we, right? So currently we have eight pharmacies in the city of Watsonville. Two of the pharmacies are currently selling tobacco products um, in Watsonville. Um, I'm assuming you wanna know the names, Walgreens, which are Walgreens and Rite Aid who are selling tobacco products. The vaping ones one. Honestly, it's, it can be any of the, if they have the license to sell tobacco, then they have the ability to sell vaping devices in their stores. So uh -huh. if you're asking specifically um, which of the tobacco stores were caught vaping products, I mean, we have that data. I don't know if it's something that you'd be comfortable disclosing, but well, we do have repeat offenders on that list. Yeah, so, I, well, I did read something about it. I don't know if it was the Watsonville newsletter that they put out for something, but they, they did put out a whole police report and they did put out places that were caught doing stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. that they went out and, and they, I think they, I can remember if they put the names of the places, but they did talk about places that they went out and found out Correct. that they were, they put that in there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so there's, over, since January uh, of this year, there's over 23 businesses who have been caught selling um, 
tobacco products to minors 32 times. So that means wow. that so that means that there's some uh, businesses who have sold more than one to minors. So let me ask you this: What can we do <laughs> for you? Once, what can we do to punish them? <laughs> is there something that we're going to do to punish them? <laughs> The Watson Police Department is currently working on revising the existing tobacco retailers licensing ordinance, and they're going to be uh, determining what that enforcement enforcement piece will look like. Okay, yeah, because I think they should be punished, to be honest with you. I mean, if they've been doing it that many times, they should be punished. Mm -hmm. I mean, they either have to pay a ton of money or do something. I mean, are requ they're required to do something. They need to be punished. I don't even know if they need to be put in jail sometimes. <laughs> I don't know, but... That's not good. <laughs> okay, so let's get, let, thank you so much for the presentation. Let's vote on the resolution, shall we? Yeah, but I'm <laughs> not happy with the resolution. So it's not so I just want to comment on this item before we move on to the next item for the resolution. I have um, several nieces and nephews in uh, PBUSD. And when I was going over some of the information, I did s uh, sit down with a couple of them, and they say, you know what, Auntie, um, it, it's getting to the point where we're, we're the ones that feel like an outcast. We're the ones that can't walk into the restroom because we are afraid that we're gonna be peer pressured into using a vaping device. So, you know, just hearing those comments and so close to home, um, just sort of speaks to how big of a problem really is for our students across the district. Um, so, so thank you for bringing this item to our attention. I really enjoyed the meeting. I think I learned so much <laughs> in the half an hour that I spent with all of you. But I think you know um, the, the role of the board of trustees is really to represent the interests of our children, and I don't think accessing vaping devices in our school grounds is in their best interest. So thank you so much for your advocacy. I'll vote for the resolution, but I'm not very happy with it because it's not strong enough. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm gonna vote for it, but not, I am not happy with it. I am, it's not nearly strong enough. <clears throat> okay. All those in favor of the resolution that's not very strong. <laughs> <laughs> So, Do have a motion? Um, point of order. Again, there is a report associated with the resolution, and that's a completely separate item from what we're currently discussing. So, all those in favor, uh, is yeah. you have a, you have a motion and a second. So we're we're going to be doing the report and reading the resolution, okay. and hopefully um, answering any concerns that you may have uh, mm -hmm. with it, Karen. Because I think when we get to the dare force, I think we have as PVUSD really taken a strong stance. And um, if approved by the board tonight, I will recommend Michelle and admin to um, send this over to the city of Watsonville, um, showing our strong support for banning um, flavored tobacco um, in the city of Watsonville. So with that, item 10.1, um, so I will be doing the report tonight, and then we will be reading the resolution, and I did ask, PB, uh, PBPSA staff uh, or even the students present to join me in reading sections of that resolution um, just so that the board knows what we're approving tonight. Um, so the Paro Valley Unified School District in coordination with the Paro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance and other par partnering public agencies has created a resolution to discourage tobacco use by PBUSD students. We have had the long-standing participation in statewide tobacco use prevention education to be efforts for our secondary and primary students and are now engaged in these efforts because there is a clear understanding of the educational implications that tobacco and substance use may have in student learning. And so with that, if I can ask staff to come to the podium from PBPSA. Whereas the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, PBUSD, works with Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, Inc., and other partnering public agencies to discourage tobacco use by PBUSD students throughout longstanding participation in a statewide tobacco use prevention education, TUPE, efforts 
for our secondary and primary students. And whereas PBUSD and PBPSA and other community partners are engaged in these efforts because there is a clear understanding of education implications that tobacco and substance use may have a student, may have a student learning and Whereas the tobacco industry has now affected young people, including elementary school aged children and teenagers in vulnerable communi communities with tobacco products and mask the harsh taste of tobacco with flavors highly appealing to youth and with advertising de designated to attract young people. And whereas it is believed that tobacco companies and retailers profit from the research proven fact that the ear that the earlier a person starts to use tobacco, the harder it will become for them to quit. And whereas smoking and vaping rates are higher among minorities of lo lower socioeconomic status, which is a result of the tobacco industry using aggressive marketing and vaping and electronic tobacco products and. Are you guys gonna go? Would I join us in? Student, students, it's students. It's your advocacy, come on. Come on, students, <laughs> come, come up there. He's right here. Right. You've made it this far already, don't stop. <laughs> And whereas tobacco retailers cluster in neighborhoods and in high percentage of low income residents or residents of color, and whereas pharmacies where individuals seek medication to care for ailments and illnesses have been found to contribute to the illegal sale of tobacco products to minors. Between 2012 and 2017, U.S. chain pharmacies failed 7.7% of Food and Drug Administration inspections of tobacco sales to minors, and whereas 23 rail retailers over the last nine months in the city of Watsonville have been found to sell products to minors under the age of 21 years of age, totaling 32 times, and whereas according to PVUSD's recent California Healthy Kids survey results, 24% of the 11th grade students reported of use or the experimentation with electronic cigarettes or other vaping devices. 11% of 11th grade students use electronic uh, cigarettes or other vaping devices. Um, devices regularly. 6% admitted to the current use of electronic cigarettes at school. 42% of 11th graders reported finding it very easy to access e-cigarettes of a vaping device. And whereas in the state of California, there are 27 jurisdictions with tobacco-free pharmacy laws and 221 jurisdictions across the nation, including the states of Massachusetts, New York, and Minnesota. And whereas 23 jurisdictions in the state of California, including the city of Santa Cruz, city of Capitola, and the County of Santa Cruz have enacted laws prohibiting sales of all flavored tobacco products, including menthol, and therefore that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District supports prohibiting the sale of tobacco near child sensitive areas. And therefore the Pajaro Valley Unified School District in collaboration with the PV PVPSA will provide staff training on how to recognize vaping devices and enforce additional supervision in, the, in an effort to deter the use of vaping devices during school hours. Else. And therefore, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District will investigate the use of tools such as sensors to deter the use of vaping devices on school grounds. Therefore, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District will provide proactive education to students for them to understand the dangers engaging in vaping and the disciplinary consequences of doing so on school grounds. Therefore, the Bajaro Valley Unified School District will work with PVPSA, Watsonville Police Department, and other partners on community outreach efforts around the dangers of vaping and tobacco use. Therefore, be it resolved that the Bajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Trustees supports as a citywide tobacco retail licensing ordinance to restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products and tobacco products and pharmacies in the city of Watsonville. Thank you. And so with that, we're asking for the board support tonight in passing this resolution. I make a motion to support the resolution. Come on, nurse. I'll second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed, 502. Thank you.
Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope we have a stronger one. Um, <laughs> so now we're going to just approve the 10.2, the Williams sufficiency of textbooks after we had our public hearing. So Lisa Gittery can come up here, but we're probably just going to vote. I guess you can just come up here again, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, thank evening, you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> thank you. So, um, so she's up here, um, and um, if there is not any discussion from the board, is there any discussion? I wouldn't think so. Okay. So, can I have a motion? Move approval. A second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed, five is Joe too. Thank you. Lisa. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, we're going to do 10.3, which is a resolution again, but it's a different kind of resolution for the week of the school administrator, October 13th to 19th this year. And it will be presented by Dr. Chona Keeling. Um, it's an honor and privilege to present resolution number 19-20-12, honoring school administrators who are critical to student achievement. Um, whereas school administrators are passionate lifelong learners who believe in the value of quality public education, whereas providing uh, quality service for student success is paramount for the administrative profession. Whereas most school administrators began their careers as teachers, the average administrator served in a public education for more than a decade. More, most California superintendents have served in education for more than 20 years. Such experience is beneficial in their work to effectively lead public education and improve student achievement. Whereas public schools across the nation, public schools employ fewer managers and supervisions compared to most public and private sector industries. Whereas school leaders depend on a network of support from school communities to promote ongoing student achievement and school success. Whereas research shows great schools are led by great principals, great districts are led by great superintendents, these site leaders are supported by extensive administrative networks throughout the state. And whereas the future of California's public education system depends upon the quality of its leadership, and now therefore be it resolved by the governing board of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District that all school leaders in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District be commended for the contributions they make to successful student achievement. Thank you so much. <coughs> okay, comments from the board? <laughs> I wouldn't think so. You can just, if anybody wanted to just say thank you, but that's okay. Thank you, administrators. I'll say something. Okay. A lot of them are sitting here in this room tonight, and um, you're sort of the um, you're the unsung heroes, really. I think in education, teachers get um, a lot of exposure and credit for what they do, and it's you guys that have gone up through the ranks that lead your schools. That a half, then you're like a middle manager, right? Because you have a lot of direct reports, way too many. You work incredibly long hours, um, but then you're sandwiched in between your staff and administration that's putting pressure on you to achieve board goals. And so I just want to acknowledge that we know you're in a difficult position and we appreciate all that you do. So thank you to all the administrators in, in our district. Yes, thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. <laughs> all right, this is an action item motion. I move to approve. I'll second. Okay, Maria's coming. She's hurrying up. She's going to vote with us. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 We're going to still have a 502. Thanks. <clears throat> and we're now almost done. <laughs> so we're going to do the consent agenda, and um, you know, I don't think we're going to have any more items deferred, correct? Okay. Um, can I have a motion for the consent agenda? 
Motion to approve our consent agenda tonight. Second. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed, thanks. <clears throat> okay, and the last part is <clears throat> we're gonna do our little closed session thing. So starting out with the, oh no, I guess we have to do the export of the suspension even though they're not gonna vote. Yeah, we have to still okay. report them. So under this item, I move to approve the suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 1920 school year with placement at another school in the district on a strict behavior contract for student number 1920-002. And I'm sorry, I'm just reporting now because we voted during closed session, so that passed with a 502 vote. And um, the board also approved another expulsion for number 1920-003 with a 502 vote for a full expulsion for the remainder of the 1920 school year with placement at another school outside of the district on a strict behavior contract. Thank you. All right. Motion number one, closed session item 2.2. .2. I move to approve the certificated personal report as presented by district and administration on September 25th, 2019 with 25 and two additional action items. Second. All right. Aye. 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 Motion number two, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personal report as presented by district and administration on September 25th, 2019 with 23 and three additional action items. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Was Aye. there a second? A second, oh, first sorry. second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so the next board meeting is scheduled for October 9th here. Thanks. <laughs>